graph or so from modus ponens, right? We fleshed out modus ponens until the point at which we got about a power graph, and the power graph spoke to the idea of water conservation. We're going to do exactly the same thing with exactly the same topic. So we're not changing the topic. The topic for the entire lecture series will be on the conservation of water, and we're going to continue that analysis using next rule of um, inference, which is modus tollens. And modus tollens says, by one, if A happens, then B happens. Line two says, B does not happen. And then line three says, therefore, A does not happen. The example that I gave in the previous series, which I recommended that everyone watch if you have not watched, um, or if you're not comfortable with symbolic logic and sort of the rules of inferences, if I eat too much, my stomach will hurt. If I eat too much, my stomach will hurt. My stomach doesn't hurt. Therefore, I haven't eaten too much. So if I eat too much, my stomach will hurt. If I eat too much, my stomach hurt, will hurt. My stomach does not hurt. Therefore, I didn't eat too much. Okay. Very, very basic. Just like we did with modus ponens before. Now with modus tollens, we're going to augment. We're going to flesh out this logical rule of inference, and we're going to appropriate the logic to the construction of an argument that continues the rhetorical analysis into, right, that continues the logical analysis into the conservation of water. Okay, so let's begin with the explanation of parts. So the key to understanding modus tollens is first to recognize the importance of the antecedent, right? Again, again we know the parts from lecture one, so I'm not going to go through and sort of itemize each part, but this is the antecedent, right? So the key important aspect, let me cap my um, marker so I don't run out of ink. Um, the key to understanding modus tollens is first to recognize the importance of the antecedent. Intuitively, we should recognize that the occurrence of B, the consequence, is itself dependent on the antecedent. This is just, you know, sort of simple logic. If, then, if, then, then occurs, then occurs if A occurs, right? Then, whatever happens in the consequence occurs if the antecedent occurs, right? If, then, so for us to talk about what occurs, we need to know the conditions which allowed it to occur. If this thing happens, then this other happens, right? So, sort of very basic. You can't break or separate the relationship between A and B. Right? B is, B is because A is. Right? This occurs because this occurs. So, very basic, very general, not going to sort of belabor that point. Um, no, actually, I will answer one question. I got a question in my initial series. There was quite a bit of discussion that was going on the rules of inference and sort of how do we know these rules of inference to be such. And now, I'm not going to go into it because it was a pretty interesting thread and I read through all of it. There's three or four people were sort of debating this in Aristotelian sense and the law of contradiction or non-contradiction, depending how you approach it. Just a quick side note, which says, you know, one in the same object in the same space time continuum can't both be A and not A at the same time. And the question is, in order for us to arrive at these sort of axiomatic, I wouldn't go so far as axiomatic, right? But in so far as we arrive at these truths of logic, how do we arrive at them? And the <laughs> the surprising thing is, the surprising response is, it's in my disclaimer, right? It's, it really is to arrive at this, right? The, the identification of one of these rules is done so, if you think about it, intuitively, right? I'm not going to get into the induction-deduction stuff, but some of the greatest discoveries in the scientific method were arrived at, were discovered as a process of inductive reasoning. There's a certain sense in which we regulate and we see our brain is conditioned by. As human beings, we are habituated cognitively by reoccurrences of phenomena within the world. I don't want to take it too deep because i got to get back to the series, but the idea is just to give you guys a, a sense, and, and gals, a sense of which how we arrive at these, because the discussion's already started, which I think is a great thing, is that we arrive at some of these truths because we see this regularity in the world. The regularity to which this 
arrow points is one of either sequence or temporal relationship. So to specifically help you guys in that discussion, just really, really quick, because I saw you, I saw a lot of people discuss, well, not a lot of people, I mean, for me, four people talking about something that I put up on the video is like a lot. This is uber nerd level, right? So the average Joe ain't watching this. But the question was, how do we arrive at these rules of inference? You know, where do they come from? How do you begin this? How would someone even approach this? We recognize that in life, things are either sequentially, conceptually, as what, what Hume would call matters of, uh, um, relations of ideas, right? Um, the idea of something, this thing, whatever it is, comes before the idea of this thing, meaning that this idea is contingent or dependent on some other idea, right? Um, so that we have sort of relational concepts of idea, but also that time, in, in, in time, right? You take four dominoes, you line them up, you hit one domino over, you see it fall to another domino. You see, like, well, if you push over the first domino and all dominoes are spaced in such a manner that they can all collapse on each other, then if you put over one, push over one domino, it has to be the case that the last domino falls, right? That fact of the matter is logic. Logic connects that fact, right? It's not, physicists can talk about the effects of, you know, inertia and such, blah, 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 transference of energy, right? But logicians can also talk about that fact of the matter. There is a fact of the matter that physicists don't account for because their tools aren't one to account for the relationship between parts, their, their tools are to account for much more complicated things, not to knock the fact that relationship between parts isn't important, right? But the idea is, how do we come about this? In exactly the same way that physics, physicists come about, and other scientists come about the truths that they discover. Mostly deductive means of uh, investigating the world, but also inductive and intuitively based um, modes of, of seeing the world. So, again, you know, this lecture series is going to be insane because it's like, it's not just the logic, it's a whole bunch of other conceptual stuff. But I think in the end, this will be freaking insane. This is going to be a, I'm going to love this contribution because I think it makes, it makes sense of a lot of things that people just have never really discussed openly, publicly. Some professor somewhere may, in the privacy of his or her classroom, touch on some of these points, but as rigorously and as methodically as I'm approaching it now, it's never been done. But the idea is, how do we come about these rules? By observing the world. So you have to be the type of scholar. You have to be the type of academic. You have to be the type of analyst, investigator. You have to be the type of, you have to be the sort of type of detective, if you will. You have to be the type of person that approaches the world always looking for clues into the nature of the world. Right? Because the world's always giving us clues. But if you're tuned in and you're worried about Snooky and her baby, <clears throat> and you're tuned in and you're worried about some other crap, then you're not tuned into the world, and the world's always giving us information as to what really is going on. There's, all, there's a very, very select few of people who, who spend their lives trying to tune in to the world to see what's there, right? This lecture series is getting you focused on what's in the world, right? So how, do, how did Aristotle come about this? He recognized that the conditional claim is one of either sequential relationship or temporal relationship, and sequential relationship in terms of relations of ideas, or temporal relationship in terms of, if you will, matters of fact, are a fact of our existence as both conscious cognitive beings, but also as deterministic, determined biological beings in sort of the world. That's where this comes from. So that was a huge tangent, but I saw the discourse taking place between a number of people, and I just wanted to tell you guys that I, I was reading your comments, I appreciate it, and I'll give you a little two cents so that you can take it to a, another level. So. Um, B is because A is, right? And this is a very, very important insight, and I just explained to you why it's important. So, how to link arguments. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to continue from the previous argument that we developed in <clears throat> our discussion of modus ponens. Still about water conservation, but we need to link the argument that we, the paragraph that we constructed from our very methodical sort of rigorous analysis and appropriation of modus ponens and connect it, link it, link that argument, link that conversation on water conservation to our argument that we are right about now to develop in modus tollens. Okay, so step one <clears throat> and linking. Link to previous argument, namely, V-I-Z, namely, modus ponens. Since we know that there is an inherent 
connection between 